the Ottomans. Hardly any Turkish ruling dynasty achieved as much fame and power as they did. Once they were the most powerful family in the world. Their state stretched across three continents. And even today, their influence still shapes the landscape of Turkey, the heartland of their former empire. From houses of worship and palaces, to castles and resorts, the Ottomans have not been forgotten. They brought up powerful rulers who were honored and feared by their own subjects and respected with reverence by foreign countries. But the true origins of the Ottoman dynasty are hardly known. At least not in the Western world. Yet, knowledge of the Ottoman Empire's prehistory is important for understanding its behavior in both domestic and foreign policy. For example, to understand why the Ottomans were so open-minded about Byzantium, or to find out how the sons and daughters of Osman controlled all of Anatolia through wars on the one hand, and a clever marriage policy on the other. Ultimately, this dynasty saw all other states as potential enemies. Because the tribe, which made possible the rise of the Ottomans to a world empire, literally had to fight for survival for centuries. Envy, discord and betrayal were common. This is the story of the Ke tribe, Certainly, when it comes to the Ottomans, many of us have the same images in mind. Magnificent palaces, in whose ornate chambers well-behaved sultans linger, surrounded by their harem of beautiful women and with an army of elite soldiers in their baggage. But apart from the raisins and genissaries, these rulers are known above all for their formidable war campaigns. Between the years 1299 and 1683, they conquered Anatolia, the Balkans, most of the Middle East, and a wide swath along North Africa. In Europe, they even made their way to the gates of Vienna. For a long time, they were considered the Supiar Piawar in Eurasia. There was no way around them. Literally, because the Ottoman blockade at the Suez motivated a certain Christopher Columbus to sail west, hoping to secure trade to India by sea and without Ottoman obstacles. The discovery of America by the Europeans could also be attributed to the Ottomans in this sense, quite unintentionally of course. However, the Ottoman Empire did not start as a giant empire from the beginning, but like any other world empire in history, as a small principality. In the 13th and 14th centuries, the Ottomans were only one of many smaller states in Anatolia known to us as Balex. For an overview of the Anatolian Balex, click on the I dot in the upper right corner of the video, which is now displayed. Each of these principalities was based on at least one of the many Turkic tribes that had migrated to Iraq, Syria, and especially Anatolia after the Seljuks victory over the Eastern Roman Empire in 1071. After a long and arduous journey from the Aral Sea, and a Mongol invasion, and several crusades later, the Beyliks established themselves as the rulers of Anatolia. A glance at the map shows that even the Ottomans started out very modestly in territorial terms. As one of the westernmost principalities, they were direct neighbors with Byzantium. It was a brave act by Osman, the founder of the dynasty, to take on the Byzantine Empire, which was still powerful at the time. He scored a surprise victory at the Battle of Baphius on July 27, 1302, cementing the state named after him as a regional power in western Anatolia. But little is known about Osman himself. There are hardly any sources about his personality, about his real Central Asian appearance and his curriculum vitae. Osman's origins are even more obscure. A detailed account of him did not appear until the 15th century, long after his death. But despite the missing pieces of the puzzle, we can reconstruct his prehistory with some degree of historical accuracy. The names of his direct ancestors are now known to every Turkish child, thanks in no small part to certain Turkish history dramas that have been running on TV sets around the world for years. But the further back we go, the more fact and fiction become blurred. In official Turkish historiography, Osman was a late descendant of the K. The K, in turn, are a tribe of Oga's origin. A tribe that was different from the others. Oga's in Old Turkic simply means tribe or community. Between 750 and 1050, the Oga's Yabgu Federation ruled over the Aral Sea region of Central Asia. Yabgu, in turn, was the title of a king or grand prince, but settled under the titles Khan and Khagan. 
We say federation because in reality, it consisted of 24 different tribes. They had banded together after the collapse of the Gokter Khaganate and had migrated, most likely, from the east to seek shelter. Climatic disasters and political persecution from the powerful Chinese also played a role in their decision. However, the Ogas did not change, but continued to maintain their tradition and religion toward Antangrism in this new homeland. Men and women were absolutely equal, and children were educated from an early age to hunt wild animals. Accordingly, boys and girls alike had to do a lot of horse riding, but also learn the use of bow and arrow. Then in adulthood, theoretically, every woman and man could be called up in case of war and fight against the enemies. A certain militarization cannot be denied, but this is not surprising given the sometimes barren landscape and the neighboring states. Mobile warfare was one of the Oga's Turk's biggest strengths. Hit and run tactics were commonplace. But the large number of potential reservists meant that these Turks could also take on powerful armies from the surrounding area. Of the 24 tribes, one particular tribe was called Kei, which means powerful. Their Tamga, a kind of emblem common to all ancient Turkic, Mongol and Hunnic tribes and states, stood for a bow with a cocked arrow. The Kei, just like all other Oga's Turks, were semi-nomads who lived by cattle breeding and participated in the lively trade along the Silk Road that passed through the Oga's territory. Internally, each tribe lived by its own rules. But outwardly, the 24 tribes had to act as one. This is the crucial difference from the Baliks of Anatolia, who sometimes fought side by side, but often against each other. Known cities of the Ogas were Sabrin, Situan, Karnak, and Otrer. From the capital Yenikant, they waged numerous wars against the neighborhood, and raids were not uncommon. For a long time, they also withstood any invasions. Oka's foreign policy focused on the Chinese, who made a strong claim on Central Asia after the demise of the Gokturks, and on the Arabs. The Abbasid Caliphate was also led by non-Arabs, but Middle Eastern and especially Islamic culture was simply foreign to the Ogas. Time and again, Abbasid warlords attacked the Federation, and each time the Turks were able to push back the invaders. In the north, they were again confronted with relatives, we should say cousins, who were of Turkic origin, but who did not want to share land or wealth with the Ogas. The Kaimak Kipchak Federation and the Karluks posed the greatest threat from other Turkic peoples for a long time until the Karakhanids, also Turkic and Islamized, appeared in the east and annexed Transoxania. And to the west, along the coast of the Caspian Sea, the Ogas faced the Khazars, another Turkic people from whom the political elite and perhaps subjects had converted to Judaism, providing an important anchor against Arab expansion in the Caucasus. Of all things, foreign policy ushered in the end of the Ogas Yabgu Federation. For the Kaimak and the Karakhanids, the new neighbors of the Ogas got into a military conflict with each other. Although the Ogas had started as a comparatively modest federation, whose existence was the top priority for all tribes, they were now very active in foreign policy. Thus, in 985, they helped the Rus to destroy the Turkic people of the Khazars in a joint attack. But now the 24 tribes were divided in their attitude. Some of them wanted to rush to the side of the Kaimak, their Tengrist brothers. Others wanted to stay out of the conflict altogether. But at least the Kinnik tribe wanted to side with the Karakhanids, with their fellow Muslims. Since the Kinnik are a minority in the federation on a religious level, and their leader Selchuk had great ambitions, they came into conflict with the other tribes. Selchuk persuaded his tribe to emigrate from Transoxania, and thousands of Oga's Turks purposefully left their homeland for the first time. A few decades later, Selchuk and especially his son Turul had achieved such great military successes against the Muslim states of the Middle East that the Seljuk Empire established itself as the major power in the area. But gradually the other Oga's tribes trickled into the region, including the Kei. Here their trace is lost. After the conquest of Anatolia by Alp Arslan and Melik Shah, the great Seljuk sultans, many Oghuz tribes settled in the former Byzantine Empire. 
Due to the Mongol raids in the 13th century, even the last tribes were forced to move out of Central Asia, Iran and Eastern Anatolia, therefore, the first Beyliks were also located in Western Anatolia, squeezed between Byzantium in the west and Mongols in the east. In 1234 and 1235, the Ke also settled here. The leader of the Ke was named Urchral. As a young man, he fought with the other Beyliks against both Byzantium and the Mongols. The Ke maintained a good relationship with the Rome Seljuks, the successors of the Great Seljuks, and also with all other principalities in the area. Step by step, they increased their sphere of influence, but always as junior partners in a larger coalition. After the Battle of Pazuryeri in 1231, for example, Urchul's warriors fought alongside Kai Kobad, Sultan of the Rum Seljuks, against the Byzantines. As a gift, Kai Kobad then awarded Urchul the city of Doralium, modern-day Eskiz here. Later, he also secured Sagat. This settlement then became the capital of the principality under Urchul's son, named Osman. Urchul probably lived until he was 90 years old, and lived to see his son raise the prestige of his family. But Osman is considered an even more ambitious leader. He managed to triple the territory of Urchul's family. Other cities such as Bialsik and Goynuk were incorporated into the principality. In addition, Osman combined his domestic and foreign policies. The doctrine of Istimalat, which guaranteed protection of foreign subjects in his realm, made him popular with Christian residents. Since the Beylik Jermian was increasingly plundering Christian settlements at the time, Osman combined his doctrine with his ambitions and took military action against his neighbors. By 1324, his empire covered some 18,000 square kilometers. Gradually, he achieved sovereignty over the Rum, Seljuks, the Mongols, and the Byzantines, whose influence in Anatolia was waning. Osman was the first of the Bays in Anatolia to rely on a standing army and to grant his fiefs to his acquaintances, officials and military personnel who had rendered services in war. In addition to a higher attachment to the Bay by the subjects, this also established a permanent settlement of the Turks in this part of Anatolia. The semi-nomadic way of life gradually came to an end. From Osman to Mehmet, the conqueror of Constantinople, it was still a long way. Just as the K once did, his descendants, whom we call Ottomans, had to stand their ground against all odds in order to stay alive at all. Warlords from the east and crusaders from the west made life difficult for them. And yet, or precisely because of this, the rise of the Ottomans could hardly be stopped.